The issue is joined. Republicans lay out a very different view of where we're headed, but equity markets, well, they just seem to keep on climbing no matter what they hear. This is a special election edition of Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This week, Secretary of Commerce Wilbur Ross. First of all, the Cold War in technology started long before President Trump. Energy Secretary Dan Briet. Former Treasury Secretary and Wall Street Week contributor Larry Summers. Former head of the Small Business Administration Linda McMahon. We know that this is a hard uphill battle. You know, PPP did so much to help small businesses. Former chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors, Glenn Hubbard. Home Depot co-founder, Ken Langone. As with any issue, I think the president made some good decisions. I think he made some unwise decisions. And former Oklahoma governor, Frank Keating. This week, it was the Republicans' turn to lay out their vision of where we are and where we need to go. A very different view from what we heard last week from the Democrats. In a new term as president, we will again build the greatest economy in history, quickly returning to full employment, soaring incomes, and record prosperity. As President Trump said, where Joe Biden sees American darkness, we see American greatness. And so, we have a second special edition of Wall Street Week. This one focused on what a second term for President Trump would mean for global Wall Street, addressing issues like jobs, trade, taxes, health care, and energy. But whatever this election may mean, the equity markets, at least so far, seem to be taking it all in stride, reaching new highs this week despite the politics and the continuing strife in our cities over policing and despite an historic hurricane hitting the Gulf Coast. We start with the economy and President Trump's economic record, as the Republicans spent four days laying out their vision of where the country is and where it should head. To take us through the economy under President Trump, we convene now our virtual roundtable of contributors Larry Summers, who served under President Clinton as Treasury Secretary and then as the director of the National Economic Council under President Obama, and Glenn Hubbard, who served as chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors under President George W. Bush. So let me start, since we're talking about a candidate for President Trump on the Republican side, Glenn, let me start with you. Uh, when you hear the plans that we're being told for the second four years, will they get us to that full employment that President Trump really promised? Well, I think conventions are obviously great theater. The president was pointing back to the pre-COVID world, and he could point to some good successes. He did have success with the economy. Unemployment was very low. Market valuations were very high. GDP growth was solid. I, I think he could well point to the Tax Cut uh, and Jobs Act, uh, and he could point to his regulatory agenda. Having said that, there's uncertainty about trade policy. And what missing was missing to me was a sense more of the future. Uh, he talks about make America great again. I'd like to see make America flourish again. What would it take to get every American to participate and prosper? I think there are ideas there on the Republican side, but I wish more of them had been at the GOP convention. Uh, so, Larry, let me bring you in on the other side of this, as it were. Is what you heard from uh, former Vice President Biden going to get us to full employment either? When he's talking about something like $3.8 trillion in new taxes, is that what this economy needs right now? This economy needs a serious program of public investment. And some part of that public investment program will pay for itself. And some part of that public investment program is rational to finance with debt. But some part of that public investment program probably should be paid for with tax increases, especially when those tax increases would make the economy fairer and would also make the economy uh, more efficient. We don't serve any useful purpose by failing to collect $500 billion a year most of it from the highest income people, because we don't do a competent job of enforcing uh, the tax law. We could move towards fixing that and raise a trillion dollars over the next decade from high income people and close tax shelters at the same time. We've got a variety of loopholes and special breaks that divert resources into inefficient uses and cost the government 
a ton of revenue. The famous carried interest provision is one example uh, in uh, that regard. Those are candidates for rational tax reform that at the same time would finance government doing what it uh, needs to do. I'm for that. I think there are people who have the idea that caused by envy, we should have tax increases in order to tear down the rich. I think that would be a mistake. There are people who have the idea that we should have tax increases for the sake of having tax increases or just as a device for reducing uh, the deficit. I think that's a mistake. But should we pay for some portion over time of the huge public investment we need? Yes, I think uh, we should. And I think that's the spirit in which Vice President Biden has uh, talked about uh, tax increases. So, Glenn, what about it? You hear from Larry that it's a matter of public investment, which really is what we need right now. On the Republican side, from President Trump, we said, let's cut the capital gains tax. Well, private investment. Is that the most efficient way, really, of getting investment, or is Larry right? Well, I think public investment is very important. We need a strong infrastructure program, not just physical, but also technological. We're seeing that play out before our very eyes. It's hard to disagree with Larry on issues like avoiding tax avoidance. Of course, we should do that. Having said that, is Vice President Biden serious about a large tax increase on business and business owners in a recession or an incipient recovery? We've got very large proposed increases in the corporation tax and individual tax rates and the most radical expansion of the payroll tax not to be used for Social Security, but to be used for other purposes. So the Biden plan may have been developed at a time and a place, but we're not at that time and that place. So while I don't disagree with Larry, it's not really the Biden plan. OK, so fairly quickly, Larry, sort of more or less yes or no. Do you think Vice President Biden is serious about that $3.8 trillion tax increase? I think Vice President Biden is serious about a major increase in public investment and paying for an important part of it though not necessarily all of it. And I think that's the right thing to do. I do not think that it's anybody's intention to impose a major new set of austerity on uh, the current economy. Glenn and I may have a disagreement. Uh, the business community before the Trump tax cuts thought it would be fantastic if the corporate tax rate were cut to 25 percent. In fact, it was cut to 21 percent. There were a set of tax cuts proposed for non-corporate businesses that nobody was even asking for. I think we should repeal and replace some of that and use the revenues to push the economy forward for everyone. And I think that is the right thing to do. And that's the spirit of the, of the Biden plan, as I understand it. Okay, so Glenn, quickly, we have a negotiation going on here. Will you take 25 percent? Will you go up 4 percent? Do you think that's a good thing? I think it depends on what the money is for. If it's for reasonable investment, if it's for uh, aid to prepare workers for the future economy and to support work, absolutely. Okay, thank you so much, Larry Summers then and Glenn Hubbard. Oh, we agree. There you have. We're raging agreement here. Larry Summers and Glenn Hubbard are going to be staying with us because coming up, the Fed takes a more relaxed approach to inflation. More on that with our roundtable. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Recently, as November, the brilliant Fed was still preoccupied not with the deteriorating economy, but with the last generation concern of inflation, which, to the Fed's apparent surprise, continues year after year to be the dog that did not bite. That was Louis Rukeyser all the way back in January 2001 on a different version of Wall Street Week, demanding a Federal Reserve be more concerned with inflation than with the strength of the economy, which comes in sharp contrast to what we heard from Fed Chair Jay Powell just this week. Our new statement indicates that we will seek to achieve inflation that averages 2% over time. 
Still with us, Larry Summers of Harvard and Glenn Hubbard of Columbia. So, Larry, I think you get a little victory lap this week because over five years ago you wrote in the Financial Times, and I'll quote it, the Fed could inject much needed confidence in the economy today and minimize future risks by announcing and following a strategy of not raising rates until it sees the whites of inflation's eyes. Now, as best I understand, that's sort of what Jay Powell said this week, isn't it? I think it's more or less exactly what he said. I think he said two important things. He made clear that the 2% figure was a two-sided target. And after a decade of being below 2%, it would be okay with him if we were above 2% for a while and that we weren't being religious about 2% as a ceiling. That's what I and many others have been advocating for a long time. And he also said that he was going to reject what has been a Fed staff preoccupation for a long time, the Phillips curve idea that uh, we should stop the party before it gets started by uh, raising rates when it looks like the economy is going to be really strong and unemployment is going to be low and wages are going to rise fast and the last, last people to be hired are going to be hired and employers are going to be reaching for less skilled workers and those with some uh, blot on their backgrounds. Uh, that. We're not going to cut off the economy's growth when those kinds of things happen until we actually see uh, inflation materialize. And I think those are two welcome, welcome and frankly overdue changes in uh, perspective uh, from the Fed. It, they're things that uh, I've been calling for for half a dozen years. Uh, in recognition of the fact that our economy's basic problem isn't an inflationary gap. It's a deflationary gap where savings exceeds investment, and that pushes interest rates too far down, causes uh, money to flow into liquid assets that then get inflated and cause bubbles, and uh, risks too much sluggishness in the economy. So I think the Fed has moved a substantial distance in the right direction. I think they've still got some way to go uh, in terms of recognizing the limits of what they're able to do and putting the right kind of pressure on other policies to push demand forward. Well, let's talk about those limits. Exactly. Glenn, let's assume you agree with Larry that essentially more or less better late than never. But at the same time, is this the cure for what ails us right now? Because this doesn't get rid of the coronavirus. It doesn't get increased productivity. It doesn't get growth going necessarily, does it? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a good step. I, too, have called for average inflation targeting for some time. But it's not a free lunch. I mean, it does give the Fed room to let the economy run hot. It's a good thing. It gives room for interest rates and yield curve to steepen. That, too, would be a good thing in the present environment. However, it may cause misallocation uh, in capital markets relative to, say, a fiscal policy response. And it isn't going to cure the coronavirus or supply side. So, yes, we can say good job to the Fed for the Jackson Hole announcement. But I don't think it's time for the Fed, at least, to be taking a victory lap. I think Washington needs to focus on fiscal policy. Chair Powell's doing his part, but it's only a part. There's a, is there another danger, Larry, actually, which we might call mission creep, borrowed from the military and, I think, Vietnam? Is there mission creep here? Because as you read what Jay Powell had to say, he was talking about all sorts of things, like really uh, fixing inequalities in income and, and wages, addressing problems with municipalities. Is that something really the Fed is competent to do? I think Glenn and I are, again, in violent agreement. Uh, what the Fed did is necessary. It is a long way from sufficient to address America's economic uh, challenges. Because the Fed, frankly, has been more successful and more competent in the last few years than other parts of uh, the government, there's a tendency to turn to the Fed to solve every problem. I don't think the Fed can fix the environment and make America green. I don't think the Fed is the right instrument for dealing with struggling municipalities. I don't think the Fed is the right instrument for addressing racial inequality. So I think the Fed's new emphasis on a strong economy, its move away from a single-minded uh, focus on preempting inflation, 
is overdue and uh, appropriate, but I don't think we should turn ourselves into an economy run uh, by the Fed. Look, uh, our problem is, one of our problems is that we've got too much leverage and too much debt. Right. And the only way the Fed has of stepping on the accelerator is to do things that encourage people to take on more debt for more purposes. And right. not all problems can be solved with more borrowing, especially right. when too much borrowing is a problem. And so right. the other part of what Chairman Powell has right. been saying in recent months that I've been applauding right. has been the emphasis on what the rest of the government has to do. Right. Well, Glenn, I want to come back to you because you hear, Larry, and it sounds right to me, we can't expect the Fed to fix the climate problems. We can't fix them, expect them to fix 400 years of racial inequality. But do they have some obligation to address some of the inequality financially? Because some of their remedy for the economy, for good and sufficient reason, has really benefited the wealthiest, the owners of capital, and disbenefited well, the, the rest. Yeah, that's an issue, David. I mean, obviously letting the economy run hotter will help marginal workers, and it may help uh, the help resolve the racial income gap. But in terms of wealth gaps, as you push interest rates down and reflate assets, that's good for people who have assets, but not for those who don't. So I just don't think the Fed is the right tool. We do have good fiscal policy tools and regulatory policy tools for social justice, and we should be using them. But I think for the Fed, that's a very blunt instrument. To care, yes. To think it can solve, does that extend as well, Larry, over the municipal uh, loan, sorry, the Main Street lending program? I think, I think the Fed is at the limit of what it should be doing. I think the better way to be doing this would be to do what we should have done six months ago uh, at the beginning of corona and pass substantial new assistance to state and local governments. It is madness that teachers are being laid off in the midst of what the economy is going through. It is madness that municipal hospitals are laying off nurses in the midst of what we're going through. It is madness that security forces, fire, what have you, uh, in uh, cities are being reduced in the midst of all the challenges uh, that we face. We should be doing much more directly from the federal government to the state and local governments rather than having the Federal Reserve be supporting uh, problematic uh, credits. And just to say one other thing, which links right. our two right. discussions, Glenn's right, right about right. we have tools for social justice. Right. The most important of them is progressive taxation. Yeah. And that's why it is important yeah. to be moving to make our tax system more progressive. There you go. And we come right back to the economic plans of these two candidates for president. Our many thanks right now to Larry Summers of Harvard and Glenn Hubbard of Columbia. Uh, both of them are contributors to Wall Street Week for this virtual roundtable. Coming up, the intersection of jobs and energy. We talked with Energy Secretary Dan Briette about what is left to do in President Trump's second term. We need to continue to build out our infrastructure. Our challenge today is actually getting the product to market. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is a special election edition of Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. President Trump began rolling back Obama-era regulations early in his administration when he took the United States out of the Paris Climate Accord. The reality is that withdrawing is in America's economic interest and won't matter much to the climate. The Trump administration also lowered U.S. vehicle emission standards, saying it would save automakers $100 billion in compliance costs. But just last week, California finalized its own fuel efficiency agreements with five automakers that are more closely in line with the Obama-era standards. The Trump administration has placed big emphasis on increasing use and production of fossil fuels. Raising taxes on 82% of Americans is not nice. Eliminating 10 million good-paying oil and gas jobs is not nice. 
Republicans and Democrats are far apart on their climate policies. But Dan Briette, Secretary of Energy, says it is possible to have a bipartisan energy plan. Sure you can. I mean, natural gas is a very clean source, and we're developing technologies here at the, at the U.S. Department of Energy to make it even cleaner. We're also developing technologies to make you know, carbon intense fuels like coal even cleaner. And of course, we always, you know, have had nuclear power for the last 70 years, which is entirely emissions free. So, I mean, you can do both. You can have a renewable generation base and you can have an emissions free base load uh, generation available to you. You just have to choose to do it. And I think that's what the fundamental problem is in places like California. They've relied too heavily or focused too heavily on renewable power like wind and solar at the exclusion of some of this baseload power, which you absolutely need in today's world to ensure that you have the energy you need when you need it. President Trump's administration has done a fair amount in trying to really, as I say, reinforce energy independence for the United States, relying in part, in significant part, on fossil fuels. What's left to be done if he's elected for a second term? What's on your agenda? Well, we need to continue to build out the infrastructure. So, you know, as you and I have discussed in the past, we have done a great job in America of increasing our production, making ourselves energy independent, relying on new technologies or newer technologies like horizontal frack, horizontal drilling and fracking to allow us to increase production of, of these resources here in the United States. Our challenge today is actually getting the product to market. It's building out pipeline infrastructure to get it to the oceans, to get it to the coastlines. It's building export facilities so that we can make this oil and gas available to the rest of the world because they're going to continue to use these types of fuels for the you know, foreseeable future, perhaps as many as 40 to 50 years out. And I think it's important that as we do this, we maintain our posture in the world as the number one producer of oil and gas. And the reason we'd like to do that is because it gives us foreign policy options. The fact that we are independent today allows us to pursue these types of foreign policy op uh, options. Energy is important in our society for all sorts of reasons, but it also is the source of a lot of employment. There are a lot of jobs in the energy industry. And one place where the Republicans and the Democrats seem to be two ships passing in the night is how we're going to create more jobs. We heard uh, former Vice President Biden say he's going to create millions of more jobs by going to green energy. We hear Republicans criticize this policy for saying you're going to lose a lot of jobs. Which is it? Aren't we adding more jobs in renewables right now than we're adding in traditional energy? Well, I, I can't really comment on Mr. Biden's comments as part of the campaign. I'm prohibited from doing that. So I will, I will stay away from that. But what I will comment on is that, you know, when we look at the technologies that have put us at the top of the world in terms of energy production, hydraulic fracturing we just mentioned, you know, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce tells me that if we were to do away with that technology, we would lose approximately 19 million jobs over the next few years. And, you know, it's not a question of retraining those people and putting them into uh, renewable technologies. You know, certainly you can do that, and people may be forced to do that if you, if you, if you do away with this technology. But the challenge with that, David, is that the, the salaries, according to the unions that we have talked to, the salaries in the oil and gas business are about twice what we're seeing in the renewable energy space. So it's one thing to suggest that you might retrain people and put them into a new role, but you're also giving them a 50 percent pay cut, according to these unions. That was Energy Secretary Dan Briette. Coming up, President Trump is running on his record of talking tough on trade. We talk with Secretary of Commerce Wilbur Ross on what the president has accomplished so far. The difference is President Trump is mounting the ramparts and starting to defend us against the technology war. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is a special election edition of Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. President Trump's tough stance on trade is a central point for his campaign. He has ended the ridiculously unfair trade arrangement with China that punched a hole in our economy. Those jobs, those jobs are coming back home. Free, fair, and reciprocal trade deals to bolster manufacturing, agriculture, technology, and other sectors. He's tough when he takes on China, tough when he works to fix our unfair trade deals. As a candidate in 2016, President Trump promised to make trade deals that would be fair to American workers and businesses. Over the past three years, he raised tariffs on imports, renegotiated a trade deal with Canada and Mexico, and brokered a phase one deal with China. 
he's been taking actions that needed to be taken that had never been taken before to straighten out the imbalance in trade. The first stage of the U.S.-China trade deal took a year and a half to negotiate and was preceded by threats of more tariffs and retaliation going back and forth between Washington and Beijing. China has emerged in many ways and we needed to adjust our policy and I think the president deserves some credit for calling out China. In spite of some of the progress on the trade deal, U.S. exports to China fell by nearly 8% from 2016 to 2019, and China continues to fall short of its promises to buy U.S. goods. The U.S. trade deficit narrowed slightly in June as global lockdown restrictions from COVID-19 eased, but the recovery is expected to be uneven. We asked Secretary of Commerce Wilbur Ross what President Trump has accomplished on his trade agenda so far. There are several very, very important things, most important of which is the revision of a very bad agreement called NAFTA into a very good agreement called USMCA. For most states, Canada and Mexico are two of the three most important export destinations. So that's a very, very important event. And what was done this time was most importantly <clears throat> to correct a grievous error in NAFTA. He also promised to really deal with China in a quite different way. Take us through what you think was accomplished in the first four years. Well, in terms of China, a lot has been accomplished. Uh, on the enforcement side, we really have been enforcing quite vigorously. You're familiar with the actions we've taken on Huawei. You're familiar with the actions that we've taken on ZTE, two major telecom companies. So, Mr. Secretary, uh, speaking of uh, China and technology for the moment, we have the TikTok issue that is pending, as I understand it. Yes. And there are various companies now who have expressed an interest. In, I'm told Microsoft, Walmart, and Oracle have all expressed an interest. As you look at these possible alternatives, what are the criteria you use in deciding which, if any of these, make sense from the U.S.'s point of view? Well, the fundamental idea is that we don't want detailed personal information on all of our teenage children who are the main users of TikTok. We don't want that information to become part of a big Chinese database to use to infiltrate our country. So that's the principal objective. Uh, whether it should be Microsoft or Oracle or someone else, that's really more for the private sector to decide. Uh, the TikTok people are essentially operating in the U.S. and a couple of other non-Chinese countries. TikTok, as I understand it, does not really operate in China. So there'll be no particular impact on Chinese apps as a result of whatever we do with TikTok. My own personal preference would be to have TikTok acquired by one of these American companies. And I think that would have the fringe benefit, not only of helping from a national security point of view, but creating more competition in the areas of Facebook and social media. That's a healthy thing. Competition is a very good thing that's kind of what makes American industry thrive. Uh, Mr. Secretary, as you uh, think about a second four-year term for President Trump, there's a lot of concern that we may be entering into what some people call a tech cold war with China. Do you believe at the end of four years with President Trump still in office, we would be more disengaged with China when it comes to technology? Well, first of all, the cold war in technology started long before President Trump. It wasn't only under President Trump that the Chinese were stealing intellectual property. It wasn't only under President Trump that the Chinese were requiring joint ventures, and lo and behold, the joint venture partners required technology transfers. So this abuse of technology, which you've called the technology Cold War, really had its origins many years before. The difference is, President Trump is mounting the ramparts and starting to defend us against the technology war. And he's doing it with the whole variety of measures that I described before, but he's doing it also in another way. 
in terms of the big initiative that was just announced about a billion dollars for further artificial intelligence research and quantum computing research. Those are two of the most significant technological advances yet to come. And so putting money here, uh, helping our companies go further is a very good thing. So there are two edges to what we're doing. The one is clamping down on their abuses and the other is fostering U.S. technology. That was U.S. Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross. Coming up, small businesses are struggling to stay afloat in the middle of a pandemic. We talked to former SBA Administrator Linda McMahon and former Oklahoma Governor Frank Keating about what it takes to support small businesses. Small businesses, you know, they, they do take the brunt of, of what's happening. Why don't we focus, get business into those communities and labor into those communities to help build them up and hire the people who live in them. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is a special election edition of Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. Small businesses are among the hardest hit by the COVID-19 crisis. According to Yelp, more than 80,000 businesses shut their doors for good from March 1st to July 25th. Firms with fewer than 500 employees account for about 44% of U.S. economic activity and employ almost half of all American workers. As part of its second term agenda, the Trump administration plans to focus on creating one million new small businesses. The lowest unemployment rate in over 50 years, women creating small businesses at record pace, wages rising, the fastest, by the way, for lowest income levels. The pandemic is having an outsized effect on minority communities. Minority populations are more likely to be in jobs that increase their exposure to COVID-19 or jobs that are cut in an economic downturn. Black and Hispanic owned businesses were more likely to be deemed at risk or distressed even before the pandemic. Seven million jobs created pre-COVID-19 and two thirds of them went to women, African-Americans and Hispanics. The first new major effort to tackle poverty in a generation, Opportunity Zones. Linda McMahon served as the head of the Small Business Administration under President Trump. We asked her about the president's economic response to the virus. We did close the country. We did shut things down because we tried you know, to get a handle on it. We didn't want to overwhelm our medical systems. And once we got that under control and started to change the curve you know, on the virus, then the president realized and knew that the economy would be killed if we didn't have to start to reopen. So he worked with the scientists to, uh, to give regulations or suggestions to the governors on both sides of the aisles on how to open up and get the economy back, in, back on track. And I think we're seeing that working. I mean, for the past three months, we've created almost 9 million jobs. You know, and um, we came out of the Great Recession by comparison. It took four years to create 9 million jobs, and President Trump has done it in about three months. So I think we're on the right track. And that's what I'd like to focus on. No question the economy is coming back somewhat, but how long is it going to take? Because even creating 9 million jobs, we still have something like 15 million people unemployed. And right now, the pattern looks like it's going to take a while to get back to where we were before. Well, I think it is going to take a while, and that's why Congress needs to get back and, and do its job and get this fourth phase of support from the government, you know, to uh, to our small businesses, to the citizens of America, because we we know that this is a hard uphill battle. You know, PPP did so much to help small businesses, and you know, small businesses. I think those that had um, well, let's just look at it for a second. Those that uh, had about 10 employees were the ones who received the majority, about 70 percent of PPP, and if you think about that. Um, about mm, a majority of those were minority businesses. And so it really was a helping hand. But we need more now. We need more stimulus. And we need the Congress to come back and do its job and get that fourth phase moving. The president decided not to wait. 
and um, he, he signed some executive orders to get some money flowing again uh, into the hands of our people through the unemployment insurance. And I think now about 30 states are on board to start doing that. But, but we, we need to get Congress back, and we need to get this enacted so we can keep this train moving in the right direction. And the executive orders, as worthy as they may be, appear to be taking longer than if we had legislation. Why don't we have a deal, Linda? We don't have a deal because Congress is not here to get the deal done. I think, you know, the Democrats wanted, they just wanted too much. Uh, they wanted too much money. They didn't want to compromise in ways that I think that made sense you know, for the president. He was very willing to compromise on many of the issues. You have your finger on the pulse, really, of small business particularly. Uh, and you are, of course, an accomplished businesswoman in your own right. How bad is it out there at this point for small business? Well, small businesses, you know, they, they do take the brunt of, of what's happening. But as I said, PPP really did help many small businesses. There were about uh, 5.1 million uh, loans, I think, made under PPP. And wow, and that really was a big help. But again, there needs to be more. That was Linda McMahon, former head of the Small Business Administration and chair of America First Action. The Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017 created incentives for opportunity zones, which attracted an estimated $74 billion in capital, according to the White House. We asked Frank Keating, former Oklahoma governor, about the role of enterprise zones in fighting poverty in underserved communities. Anything we can do as a people to encourage enterprise and success in the inner city, we've got to do it. And enterprise zones, basically, were creatures of a lot of people, but Jack Kent most particularly, we're going to take uh, neighborhoods, for example, communities that are ravaged and find out why. I mean, do we need to have dramatically better schools? We never did anything about that, quite truthfully and regrettably. Um, how about, uh, does it take forever to get a permit? Um, how about, are the buildings all disintegrating? Why don't we focus, get business into those communities and labor into those communities to help build them up and hire the people who live in them. Of course, you know, Jack was funny. He would, uh, he was of the view that that should be a very significant part of the renaissance of the inner city. But he also wanted to have America such a broad-minded society that if I, as a black person, wanted to leave, I could do that too and find a job and live someplace else without fear or without prejudice. And that is the party of Lincoln, and I think that's the legacy of Jack Kemp. You know, there's been such a stark dividing line between the parties in terms of their ability to attract support from African Americans. What do you think the Republican Party could do to bridge that divide? What would you like them to say during this week, for instance, to appeal more to African Americans? Because the enterprise zone certainly is something that should appeal, but we just don't seem to hear enough about it. Let us restore our affection and goodwill in your hearts by what we do with you, not for you, but with you as partners. I think that was the King legacy. Um, we are all equal. Let us work together. So in a city environment, and there are a lot of very, very fragile cities that have a lot of problems. We've seen them blowing up here recently. It's important, as many of them do, to have African-Americans, black city dwellers who are in law enforcement. Many of these cities have black leadership. They have black law enforcement leadership. That's hugely important. Blue lives matter. That said, we also look at tax codes, zoning restrictions. How long does it get you? Get, does it take you to get a building permit? And certainly, the tax laws, as a result of the enterprise zone legislation, do say to entrepreneurs, come in. You know, participate with us in making this community big time significant. And, and I think that's something that we need to do. That was Frank Keating, former Oklahoma governor. Coming up, the U.S. healthcare system is facing its biggest test from COVID-19. We talk with Ken Langone, chairman of the NYU Langone Medical Center, about what the pandemic says about our healthcare system. As a society, we need to make damn certain that nobody wants the healthcare. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg.
This is a special election edition of Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. COVID-19 is shining a light on the state of health care in the United States. President Trump has made no secret of what he thinks of the Affordable Care Act. We have to repeal and replace Obamacare. We can repeal it, but the best is repeal and replace, and let's get going. President Trump's Jobs and Tax Cuts Act of 2017 scrapped the ACA individual mandate, but his request for the Supreme Court to strike down the entire law is still pending. Everything we did happened in spite of Joe Biden and his old boss. They want to tell Americans how to live and what to think. They want a government takeover of health care. Health care costs are higher in the United States than in other developed countries. Health care accounts for 8% of all consumer spending, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Health care costs are a problem. It's not just an increase in health costs, it's an increase in federal health spending. It's an increase also in out-of-pocket costs, which workers, uh, employees, Americans have felt very acutely. Health care spending grew 4.6% in 2018, reaching $3.6 trillion. Health care expenditures as a share of the nation's GDP has been growing steadily as tax revenue as a share of GDP comes down. We asked Ken Langone, chair of the board of trustees of NYU Langone and co-founder of Home Depot, what COVID-19 taught us about U.S. health care. I think what we learned is objectively and not politically, we need to sit down and say, okay, what do we do? I think, for example, in the shutdown, we could have been better organized. You could argue, and I'm not making that point, but you could argue that we overreacted with the shutdown the way we did it. Well, on the other hand, there's nothing more precious than life itself. So I'd rather be wrong, excessively wrong, and know it saves some lives than to be right and lose some lives. Life is precious, especially in America. We value life, thank God, as part of our basic, that is our basic value. The value life. So I think we could have done a much better job being prepared. Uh, Ken, as you look at health care policy over the next four years, the Democrats have clearly said they want to move toward universal coverage. Put aside whether it's public, private, how you get there. Uh, do you think that that's a good thing to strive for, however we get there? It depends on what it means. Somebody like myself, people in my firm, we have a wonderful insurance plan. Wonderful. We'd like to keep it. Why? We can afford it. I do believe that we, as just for our, our core values as a society, we need to make damn certain that nobody wants the health care. People should not be in a shelter dying from a disease because they can't afford to go to a doctor. To a doctor. So, I think, I think we crossed that bridge many, many years ago when we said we have a strong moral obligation to help the least blessed among us. And I feel strongly about that. I think, again, here's a case where it was politicized. I think we ought to sit down and we ought to say, oh, God, but David, this goes to a bigger issue. This goes to entitlements. And I've said this before to you. I think it's a disgrace that somebody who's done as well as I have gets a check from the U.S. government for $3,000 every month. My wife gets another 1000 I think that's a damn disgrace. I shouldn't get a nickel. Look, I, I think cool heads ought to sit down at a table with a blank sheet of paper and a pencil and say, okay, how do we get to the point where we have a health care delivery system that's available to all, recognizing that people would like individual choice as well. When you allow young people to opt out, the numbers don't work. And so you said, not only can you opt out, but you can be covered by your parents' insurance policy. Well, that was good politically, but as a practical matter, actuarially, and in practice, it's a disaster. So. I just wish, David, that all of us could put our biases aside and sit down 
and ask the question, okay, how do we get to where we want to be? So for a voter going to the polls on November 3rd, let's assume that their number one concern was our health care system, a lot of the things that you've just been talking about, recognizing there's no perfect candidate. Uh, as between Joe Biden and Donald Trump, is there a better one? We have to figure a way out to take this out of the political arena, i.e., not Trump, not Biden, not their people, and put it and say, okay, where do we do the most good and create the least harm? And maybe some good ideas from the Democratic side, and maybe some good ideas from the Republican side. But you know, I'm talking about utopia right now. When I tell you what I think we should do, because it ain't gonna work that way. Ken, as we look at the U.S. economy, the coronavirus plays a very big role in how the economy is doing. Where are we right now with the coronavirus? And are you disappointed in the job President Trump has done? As with any issue, I think the president made some good decisions. I think he made some unwise decisions. The good decision was jumping on it right away regarding flights in from China. I think I wish he had a different stand on masks, because I said earlier that masks to me are a very critical part of the defense against the pandemic. So I wish that he had embraced masks sooner and more enthusiastically. That was Ken Langone, Home Depot co-founder and chairman of the NYU Langone Medical Center. Finally, one more thought. This week will be remembered not just for a Republican convention that nominated President Trump for a second term, but also for the 100th anniversary of ratification of the 19th Amendment, which gave women the right to vote, something that President Trump commemorated last week by pardoning Susan B. Anthony, the woman suffragist convicted of the crime of voting as a woman in 1872, for which she was fined $100. First Lady Melania Trump also spoke of the 19th Amendment and how it has changed this country. This November, we must make sure that women are heard and that the American dream continues to thrive. So maybe it's only fitting that this year, a century after women were finally allowed to vote, they're seen as the key by both parties to getting a victory in November. It only took us 100 years from punishing women for even expressing their political views to candidates building their entire campaigns around those views. That does it for this edition of Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This is Bloomberg. See you next week.